Privet Russian. Guten Tag, German. Konnichiwa, Japanese. Welcome to Fireside Chats. We're going to start reading the story. The next day was quite even, even flow at 432 Proudfoot Avenue. First, there was the service was the serviceman that and then the police and then the trouble about the life and Captain Cook was in the children's room watching Janie and Bill put together a jigsaw puzzle on the floor. He was very good about not disturbing the pieces after Bill had thanked him for eating one. He did not hear the refrigerator serviceman come to the back door. Mrs. Papa had gone marketing for canned shrimp for the penguin so that Mr. Papa, Papa was alone in the kitchen to explain to the serviceman what he wanted done to the refrigerator. The serviceman put his tool bag down in, on the kitchen floor, looked at the refrigerator, and then at Mr. Papa, who, to tell the truth, had not saved yet and was not very tidy. Mr. He said, you don't need to You don't need to. You don't need no ventilating holes in the in, in that, that there thing. door. It it's my Xbox, and I want some holes for it in that door. Said Mr. Papa. They argued about it for quite a while. Mr. Papa knew that he could get the serviceman to do what he wanted. All he had to do was to explain that he was going to keep a, a live penguin in the icebox and that he wanted his pet to have plenty of fresh air. Even through the door was closed all night, he felt a little stubborn about explaining how every ever he didn't want to discuss Captain Cook with his unsympathetic serviceman who all was already staring at Mr. Papa, as if he thought Mr. Papa was not quite right in his head. Come on, do what I said, said Mr. Papa. I pay, I'm paying you for this. For with what? Asked the serviceman. Mr. Papa gave him five dollars. It made him. A little sad to think how many beans it would have bought for Mrs. Papa and the children. The serviceman explained the examined in the boat carefully as if he didn't trust Mr. Papa too much, but at last. He put it in his pocket, took a drill from his tool bag, and made five small holes in a neat pattern on the refrigerator door. Now, said Mr. Pepper, don't get up. Wait a minute. There is one more thing. Now what? said the serviceman. I suppose now. You want me to take the door off its hinges 
little bit in a little more air. Or do you want me to make a radio set out of your icebox? Don't get for me, said Mr. Puppy. Indignantly. Indignantly. Dog. That is no way to talk. Believe it or not, I know what I'm doing. I mean, having you do what you do fix and extra handle on the inside of that box so it can be opened from the inside of the box that ship is still the same it's a fine idea you want an extra handle on the inside sure sure he picked up his tool bag aren't you going to do it for me asked mr puppet oh sure sure it is still the same Edging toward the back door, Mr. Papa said that for all his word of agreement, the serviceman had no attention putting in on an inside handle. I thought you were a serviceman, he said. I am. That's the first sensible thing you've said yet. You'll appoint kit kind serviceman if you don't even know how to put out an extra handle on the inside of an ice box so oh I don't don't uh oh I don't don't uh didn't don't think I don't know how as far as that goes I've even got a spare handle in my tool bag and plenty of tools you needn't think i don't know how to do it if i wanted to mr papa silently reached into his pocket and gave the serviceman a size five dollar bill he was Pretty sure that Mrs. Papa would be annoyed at him for spending all that money, but it could be, it could not be how Mr. said the serviceman, you and I'll fix you your extra handle, and while I am doing it, you sit down on that chair over there facing me where I can keep an eye on you. Fair enough, said Mr. Papa sitting down. Serviceman was still on the floor putting the final screws that held the new handle in place. place. When the penguin came out to the kitchen on its silent, silent pink feet, surprised at seeing a strange man sitting on the floor, Captain Cook quietly walked over and began to check him curiously, but the serviceman was even, even more surprised than Captain Cook. Walt, said the penguin, or perhaps it was the serviceman. Mr. Papa was not sure just what had happened. When he picked up himself and his chair a moment later, there had been a slower or flying 
Jules of Bavoy in slamming of the door and the policeman is gone. He's sudden noises of course noises of course but the children warming the stir popper showed them how the refrigerator was now all Captain Cook to by shedding him inside it. The penguin at once noticed the shiny new inside handle and fit it with his unusual curious curiosity. The door opened and Captain Cook jumped out. Mr. Papa Papa proudly put Captain Cook back inside and shut the door again to be sure that the penguin learned his lesson before long. Captain Cook became quite skillful at giving out and was ready to be taught how to get inside when the door was shut. By the time a policeman came to the back door. Captain Cook was going in and out the refrigerator as easily as if he had lived in one all his life. Your time. Chapter 6. More troubles. The children were the face, or the first to notice the policeman. Look, Papa, said Bill, there's a policeman at the back door. Is he going to meet, is he going to arrest you? What does that say? Cook. Cool, said Captain Cook. Walking with dignity in the door and trying to peek his beak through the screen. Is this 432 Pro Proudfoot Avenue? It is, answered Mr. Popper. Well, I guess there is the place. This is the place, all right, said the policeman and pinned to Captain Cook. Is that thing yours? Yes, it is, said Mr. Popper. Generally and proudly. And what do you do for a living, asked the policeman. Papa is an artist, said Janie. He always getting paint and calcite all over his clothes, said Bill. I'm a house painter, a decorator, said Mr. Pepper. Won't you come in? I won't, said the policeman, unless I have to. Ha ha, said Bill. The policeman is afraid of Captain Cook. Ga, said the penguin, opening his beak wide as if he wanted to laugh at the policeman. Can it talk, asked the policeman. What is it, a giant parrot? It's a penguin, said Jeannie. We keep it for a pet. Well, if it's only a bird, said the policeman, lifting his cap to scratch his head in a puzzled sort of way. From the way that fellow with the tool bag yelled at me outside, I thought there was a lion loose in here. Mama says Papa's hair looks like a lion sometimes, said Bill. Keep still, Bill, said Janie. The policeman doesn't care how Papa's hair looks. The policeman now scratched his chin. If it's only a bird, I suppose it'll be okay if you keep him in a cage. We we keep him in the icebox, said Bill. You can put it in the icebox for all I care, said the policeman. What kind of bird did you say it was? A penguin, answered Mr. Popper. And by the way, I might want to take him walking with me. Would it be all right if I kept him on the leash? I tell you, said the policeman. Honestly, I don't care what the municipality or municipal penguins is. With or without a leash on the public streets, I'll ask my sergeant. Maybe I ought to get a license for him, suggested Mr. Pepper. It's certainly big enough for a license, said the policeman. I tell you what to do. You call up the city hall, ask them what the ruling about penguins is, and good luck to you, Mr. Popper. He's kind of cute little fellow at that. Looks almost human. 
Good day to you, Mr. Popper. And good day to you, Mr. Penguin, when Mr. Popper telephoned the city hall to, set, to see about a license for Captain Cook. The Penguin did his best to disconnect the telephone by biting the green cord. Perhaps he thought it was some kind of kind of eel. But just then, Mrs. Popper came back from market and opened a can of shrimp so that Mr. Popper was soon left alone at the telephone. Even so, he found it was so easy to learn whether or not he must get a license for a strange pet. Every time he would explain what he wanted, he would be told, wait a minute, and much later, a new voice would ask him what he wanted. This went on for a considerable time. At last, a new voice seemed to take a little interest in the case. Pleased with the friendly wait, Mr. Popper began again to tell about Captain Cook. Is he an army captain, a police captain, or a navy captain? He is not, said Mr. Popper. He's a penguin. Will you repeat that, please, said the voice. Mr. Popper repeated. The voice suggested that the penguin, he had better spell P-E-N-G-U-I-N, said Mr. Popper. Penguin. Oh, said the voice. You mean that Captain Cook's first name is Benjamin? Not Benjamin, Penguin. It's a bird, said Mr. Popper. Do you mean, said the phone in the car, that Captain Cook wishes a license to shoot birds? I am sorry. The bird hunting season does not open until November. And please try to speak a little more distinctly. Mr. Topper, did you say that's your name? My name is Popper, not Topper, shouted Mr. Mr. Popper. Yes, Mr. Potter. And now I hear you quite clearly. Then listen, recorded, roared Mr. Popper. Now completely outraged. If you folks at the City Hall don't even know what penguins are, I guess you haven't any rule saying that they have to be licensed. I will do without a license for Captain Cook. Just a minute, Mr. Popwell. Our own Mr. Treadbottom of the Bureau of Navigation of the Lakes, Rivers, and Ponds and Streams has just come in. I will let you speak to him personally. Perhaps he knows this Benjamin Cook of yours. In a moment, a new voice was speaking to Mr. Popper. Good morning. This is Automobile License Bureau. Did you have the same car last year? And if so, what was the license number? Mr. Popper had been switched over to the county building. He decided to hang up. Chapter 7, Captain Cook Builds a Nest. Very reluctantly, Janie and Bill had to leave Captain Cook and go to school. Mrs. Popper was busy in the kitchen, either belatedly doing the breakfast dishes, and while she dimly realized that the penguin was going in and out of the refrigerator pretty frequently, she thought nothing of it at first. Meanwhile, Mr. Popper had abandoned his telephone and was now busy shaving and making himself neat in honor of being the owner of such a splendid bird as Captain Cook. But the penguin, though thus neglected for the moment, was by no means idle. With the unusual excitement and having to go to market earlier than usual, Mr. Popper had not yet got around to straightening the house. She was an excellent housekeeper, still with two children like Jimmy and Bill, and a husband with such untidy ways, there's no denying the fact that she had to pick up the place rather frequently. Captain Cook was now attending to picking up into the corners of every room. He prowled and poked and pecked with a busy thoroughness into every closet. He stared with his white circle eyes under and behind all the furniture. He crowded his plump figure with little subdued cries of curiosity, surprise, and pleasure. And each time he found what he seemed to be looking for, he picked it up in black end of the red beak and carried it, waddling proudly on his wide pink feet into the kitchen and into the icebox. At last, it occurred to Mrs. Popper to wonder what the what the earth the busy busy bird was up to. When she looked, she could only scream to Mr. Popper to come quickly and see what Captain Cook had done now. Mr. Popper himself, looking rather remarkable, as Mrs. Popper noticed later, joined her in staring with astonishment into the refrigerator. Captain Cook came up, too, and helped them look. Ork, ork, he said with triumph. 
Mrs. Popper left and Mrs. Popper gasped as they saw the results of Captain Cook's ships through the house. Two spools of thread, one white chess bishop, and six parts of jigsaw puzzle, a teaspoon and a closed box of safety matches, a radish, two pennies, a nickel, and a golf ball. Two pencil stubs, one bent playing card, and a small ash tray. Five hairpins, an olive, two dominoes, and a sock. A nail file, four buttons of various sizes, a telephone slug, seven marbles, and a tiny doll's chair. Five checkers, a bit of graham cracker, a part cheesy cup, and an eraser. A door key, a button hook, and a couple pieces of tinfoil. Half of an old, very old lemon, the head of a china doll, Mr. Popper's pipe, and a ginger ale cap. An ink bottle cork, two screws, and a belt buckle. Six beads from a child necklace, five building blocks, a darning egg, a bone, a small harmonica, and a partly consumed lollipop. Two toothpaste lids and a small rod notebook. I guess this is what you call the rookery, said Mrs. Mr. Popper. Only he couldn't find any stones to build his nest with. Well, said Mrs. Popper, those penguins may have heathen ways at the South Pole. But I declare, I think this one is going to be a quite help around the house. Orc, said Captain Cook. And strutting into the living room, he knocked over the best lamp. I think, Papa, said Mrs. Popper, that you had better take Captain Cook outside for a little exercise. Good gracious. But you're all dressed up. Why? You look almost like a penguin yourself. Mr. Popper had smoothed down his hair and shaved off his whiskers. Never again would Mrs. Popper have to reproach him for looking as wild as a lion. He, he had put on a white shirt and a white tie and a white flannel trousers and a pair of bright tan oxblood shoes. He had got out of the cedar chest his old black evening tailcoat and he had that he'd been married in and brushed it carefully and put it to on to. He did indeed look at look a little like a penguin he turned and strutted like one now for mrs popper but he did not forget his duty in captain cook can i have a few yards of clothesline please mama that's mrs penguin <laughs> now so we'll start chapter eight another day with danny and daddy reading mr popper's penguins i'm actually not you yeah, you are right there. Fireside Chats, see you again.